really a pleasure for me. I'm, I'm Mark Brown, by the way, um, president of the Princeton Adult School, so again, welcome. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce tonight's speaker, um, Mr. Abed Awad, Esquire. Um, Mr. Awad is an attorney, a public speaker, and a community leader. His practice is in uh, New Jersey and New York area and focuses on uh, general civil litigation, including complex <coughs> matrimonial law, commercial law, Islamic law, and international law, all pertinent to tonight's uh, talk. Uh, prior to entering private practice, Mr. Awad was a law clerk for Honorable George Sabbath of the New Jersey Superior Court. Uh, he is an adjunct law professor at three different law schools, at Rutgers at Newark, Pace Law School in New York, and Seton Hall Law School in Newark. He teaches three courses. The one is about Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic banking and finance is another one, and the third one is matrimonial litigation. Mr. Awad is a frequent uh, political and legal commentator for numerous TV and uh, radio networks, and perhaps some of you have uh, seen or heard him on, on these various networks. His education goes back to uh, St. Peter's College, uh, in Jersey City for his undergraduate uh, degree. He studied at Columbia University in, in graduate level uh, coursework in the Islamic uh, movement. Uh, he received a master's in Near and Middle East Studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. And he received his uh, year's doctor, uh, doctorate, his uh, law degree from Pace University School of Law. Uh, it's really a pleasure for us to have him here tonight. I, um, I'm very happy he was willing to drive all the way down from Hoboken, I believe, was, or, or Asper Heights uh, earlier today, and is uh, driving back to Wayne uh, after the lecture. Uh, I also want to uh, welcome his son, who is a high school senior and is looking forward to entering college, and maybe it'll be this college. <laughs> <laughs> never know. Um, the topic tonight is, why does Islamic jurisprudence matter today? Please join me in welcoming Abed Awad. Everybody hear me? Thank you very much, Mark, for that very kind introduction. It's really my, my honor and pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, and I am hoping that we're going to have a lively uh, exchange. I'm going I'm to lecture for about 35 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, and allow uh, some discussion and answer questions. Um, I see that many of you are uh, older gentlemen <laughs> and uh, women. And uh, to you, what you represent to me is probably the lively, dynamic civil society of the United States, of my country, which I feel that our civil society is kind of under, under the gun lately. It's not as dynamic during your generation. So I expect to be much more lively tonight than my usual lectures to law students or uh, lawyers who are just attending to get the credit. <laughs> so last year, um, I, I'm, as, as Mark explained, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an attorney. I'm primarily a litigator. I handle a lot of uh, complex divorce actions, and sometimes I handle a lot of child abduction cases and international cases. A lot of my, my, my family law cases uh, involve different countries or involve uh, cases uh, revolving around foreign uh, jurisdictions and different laws. So my uh, title of, of the lecture today is Why is Islamic Law Relevant Today? Well, that's what I do for a living, and I practice. <laughs> so uh, if, if I'm not able to convince you that it's re relevant, then I, I might have to find another job. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a lot of my cases and uh, make it more practical for you to understand the inter intricacies and the interrelationship between American law and Islamic law and many other foreign legal systems. So last year, I get a call from a uh, Caribbean country, from a left-behind father. So the father calls me up and says, my wife abducted my daughter uh, to New Jersey, so I'm looking to retain a lawyer. In international child abduction cases, the majority of countries around uh, the, the world are signatories to a convention called the International, the Hague Convention for the International Aspects of Civil uh, Child Abductions. 
So, of course, I take on the case, and I am starting to prepare my research, and uh, I realize that the United States Supreme Court entered a recent decision. The decision is called Abbott versus Abbott. And it involved whether a nia exeat order, which means that if there's an order saying that a parent is pro prohibited from leaving the country with his child, is that considered a right of custody? Therefore, the International uh, Hague Convention would apply. So, of course, as a Thor lawyer, I'm reading this decision, and I have the opportunity to say, well, let me see, let me read the oral argument that... Uh, ex the exchange that took place between the United States Supreme Court justices and the lawyers arguing this Abbott versus Abbott. So I'm reading, and I, this case, Abbott, has nothing to do with Islam, the Middle East, or Arabs, or Islamic law. It, the abduction in the case Abbott versus Abbott was a uh, child abducted from Chile to Texas. And this is what happens in the uh, discussion. This is what Chief Roberts says. So Chief Justice Roberts asked the following question to the attorneys. If you have the mother taking her daughter from a country where she would be forced to be raised under Sharia law, is it up to that country to decide whether the child has to be returned? So even at the Supreme Court of the United States, the inability to look at the complexities of different foreign legal systems, to immediately look wholesale that a daughter is going to be forced to be raised under Sharia, as if that's the boogeyman of the Supreme Court, that the Sharia is so horrendous, so horrific. Are you telling me that our law is going to say that we have to take this child and return her back to the habitual residence where she was born and raised? So even at that level, the negative connotations that are surrounding this word that we call Sharia, or we translate it to Islamic law, is not only in your mainstream, but even at the highest level of our court, they also have this negativity surrounding it. And this negativity, starting sometime in 08, 09, has created a, uh, the, the Muslim community as a whole under the microscope, that this whole thing about Sharia is something mysterious, alien, and it's scary. So now we hear people saying that Sharia is the next mortal threat mimicking the Reagan period of the mortal threat of communism. Mm -hmm. Others calling it the next red scare. Sharia is here to circumvent our law and to transplant our constitution and our separation of state and church. They're coming here to take over. Mind you, there's probably 1% of the United States are Muslim, the majority of which uh, don't even comply with, uh, with, with Sharia. Nor is there anyone saying that any foreign system, for that matter, whether it's French law or Sharia, would ever supplant our constitution. So the nuance and the legal subtleties of how foreign law interplays in our system is lost in this politicization. And what I'm hoping to, to give you examples is we can dissect it and just peel away all of this politicization, and we will find out that this whole paranoia about foreign law and international law is much but do about nothing. So we're going to take some examples. So for, for starters, what is Sharia? Sharia is not law, in the, simply law in a prescriptive sense. It's much more than that. The one thing, there's a very, very interesting scholar uh, at Columbia University. His name is Professor Wet Halab. And he's, he's been writing some fascinating uh, books and scholarly articles about this concept about the moral law. Because you, as a lawyer, as I was trained, I, I went to school in England for my graduate school and law school here, we were trained that there is a huge distinction between what is legal and what is moral. And this is how we've been trained in a Western-based system. Because this is a capitalist-based system focused on the bottom line. Because if we mix moral with legal, the, the capitalist system may have some issues. Because the problem becomes, and I, and I have this in, in, in my class on Islamic finance, and Catholic finance is, is something happening now, by the way, for, for those of you who may have heard about the economy of the communion. A lot of the faith-based communities are also starting to rethink our capitalist system. Is that there has to be something called social responsibility. There is some moral accountability to society. It's not just simply the bottom line. So you have in Islam 
a moral economy based on certain restrictions to ensure that people are not exploited, that there's more harmony in society as opposed to disharmony. And you have this movement in this Catholic uh, church talking about a more, a, 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 an economy of the, of the communion, which focuses on paying back and not investing in things that are unethical or hurt the economy. So be that as it may. Now we, we go to this particular uh, issue about what's legal and what's moral. So I, um, I was watching a documentary regarding the financial collapse. And many of the rating companies had rated many of these subprime mortgages as AAA. So everybody was investing because it's AAA and it's from Moody's and it's from Standard and Power and Poor's and so forth and so on. So when the collapse took place, the executives from these rating companies were brought into Congress in these hearings. So the uh, rating companies hired the best lawyers uh, in the country, specifically that specialize in First Amendment rights and freedom of expression. So the executives took the position is that we had the right to express our opinion. We didn't expect everybody to be relying on our opinion, but that was just our opinion. It's our opinion. And what they did was legal. So the bottom line is it was legal, but the question was, was it moral? So what passes the legal test is not necessarily what passes the moral test. And the Sharia as a legal system is a morally based system, such as the canon law is a morally based system. Actually, all legal systems prior to the Enlightenment were most likely moral-based systems. This distinction between what's legal and moral, I believe, I, I'm not an absolute authority on this issue, but I believe may have started sometime in the 15th or 16th century with the rise of the Industrial Revolution and, and the economy. So we have to look at the Sharia as a moral system and understand that it's not simply the law in a prescriptive sense. So it is more than that. It is this methodology to uh, ascertain divine will. So the Sharia, when you say Sharia, it means that you have Muslims, whether scholars or not, who are looking at the foundational text in their religion, which happens to be the Qur'an, similar to the Old Testament or the Bible, and these traditions that we call the sayings of the Prophet, things that the Prophet Muhammad did during the time of his life, things that he approved, disapproved, um, the way he conducted himself. So those are the foundational uh, written texts. So Muslims and jurists would engage in reading this, these texts to define or ascertain divine will, to construct divine intent. So the, the, the Sharia is, is more of a methodology. In addition to that process of engaging the divine text leads you to an uh, outcome of what you thought what divine will is. But according to Sharia, divine will is there's no monopoly over divine will. Therefore, not having a uh, church hierarchy, per se, that this is what the divine interpretation of this particular uh, verse means. There is no unanimity on an interpretation of a verse or a legal decree. Because if you have monopoly over divine will, then you're going to have one answer. And that diversity and that dynamic uh, di disputation history of Islamic law that created so much diversity in opinion would simply collapse because centralization of what divine will is is probably the source of much um, oppression and, and, and much uh, suppression of other opinions. So as Sharia, as you can see, is much more complex than just simply saying it's a moral code. It is immoral code, but it's more than that. And for Muslims who live in the United States, Sharia to them is everything about their existence. The way they eat, uh, the way they drink, the way they treat their parents, the way they distribute their estate at death, the way they deal with animals, the way they uh, uh, decide how to marry when they solemnize their marriages, the way how they dissolve their marriages, so Sharia is everything about your total, subtotal of who you are as an individual if you are a compliant, pious Muslim intent on complying with the moral dictates of, of the divine. You want to please the divine, so you're 
following these particular precepts. So Sharia is very uh, complex. Now, this pre-modern perspective, or this moral system, or this methodology to engage in the divine, to construct divine meaning, no longer exists in modernity. I mean, this is a pre-modern system that functioned very well up until the 13th century. Today, the modern manifestations of what we call Sharia is a little bit different. So when we look at the modern manifestations, specifically with the rise of the nation state, for example, the legislator has exclusive authority to make law. But in the pre-modern system, the caliph did not have that authority to make law. He had very limited authority in that regard. The exclusive authority rested with the jurists and the jurist consults. They made the law. But with the rise of the nation state and needing to centralize for an efficient economic system, uh, you need to centralize the law. So the law emanates all from one particular branch of government. Uh, when in when the Islamic pre-modern time, that wasn't the case. So with the rise of the nation state, as you can imagine, the first thing that's going to go is this independence of the jurist creating the law. So now the law emanates in modern majority Muslim countries from the legislator. Similar, it's a Western nation-based system. So this modern manifestation created what? It created Sharia to be either a source or of a primary source of the legislation that emanates from the legislator. So when we say as the primary source, we have several, primarily one country, which is Saudi Arabia. Is Sharia is the law of the land. That is the primary source of their legislation. In fact, still 12th, 13th century seminal treatises in the Hanbali school of law are consulted on a regular basis uh, by judges in Saudi Arabia. And in fact, we have a fascinating case that took place in the United States revolving around Saudi law, including an interpretation uh, of uh, a commercial aspect in, in, uh, in, in Islamic uh, commercial law. And I, I'm going to talk about that case. So, but in the other countries, that it is not the primary source of the legislation, countries such as Egypt, Jordan, uh, Qatar, UAE, uh, Sudan, the majority of, of, of Muslim countries, Sharia is a source of the legislation. So it has, it is utilized 99% in family law. So you would find that the family law, Islamic family law, uh, the pre-modern Islamic family law has been codified in family codes in all these countries. So if you would go to Egypt, for example, I've worked a lot on Egyptian family law. The code codifies the pre-Islam, uh, the, the pre-modern Islamic or the classical Islamic family law. They take from different schools of law and they codify it. And as I explained earlier, Islamic law is really contrary to codification because you cannot mon monopolize divine will or interpretation. So you would look as the, the primary source for that code is classical Islamic law. It's the same for the family code in Syria. It's the same for the family code in Jordan. So in the family area, pre, uh, or, or classical Islamic law still is very strong in the family area. But when we look at the uh, commercial code, at their corporations, their business laws, their criminal laws. In most of these countries, it is a Western-based code. The criminal law is almost identical to the criminal law of France. Most Muslim countries, by the way, do not follow the Anglo uh, legal system or the common law system. They were influenced primarily by the civil code in France. So that's why most Muslim countries have civil codes. You have the actual, the Egyptian civil code, the Jordanian civil code, the Syrian civil code, the UAE civil code. Most of these countries follow the statutory-based French system. So in the family law, it's still very powerful. So it's relevant today for purposes of Muslim countries in the family law area. It's also still relevant in gap filler areas. In other words, even in the civil code, you will see a provision in the civil code that would say something along the lines, if there is no express law or statute that applies to a particular dispute, the judge is instructed to rely on Islamic law, Islamic principles of justice, and so forth and so on. And the same applies in the family code. If you don't have an answer to a question in the family code, then you will revert to uh, the school of Hanafi 
law according to, you know, so-and-so. So the Sharia still is relevant even in those countries in the non-family law area. The other area where it's still very, it's, it's burgeoning area and it's coming, uh, becoming very uh, lively is in the Islamic finance area. It's believed that the Islamic finance area is a, is a trillion dollar business currently. And this uh, Islamic finance is purported to be governed by pre-modern or pre-classical uh, Islamic commercial law. So in that area, Islamic law becomes relevant too because there's a lot of disputes arising out of, for example, I was reading yesterday, because I follow anything that's going on with Islamic law in the United States. By the way, I have a blog that's called uh, Islamic Law in America. We try to uh, gather a lot of the uh, American cases that involve some form of Islamic law or are relevant to Islamic law or Middle Eastern law. There's a bankruptcy, a very large uh, investment firm, I think based in uh, Bahrain, and it was having some problems because of the financial collapse. So they filed for chapter for bankruptcy, I think in the Southern District of New York. And I was reading, I, I was looking in the clerk's office and, and, and seeing about the filings in that particular case, and I find the first Sharia compliant bankruptcy application. What happened was that the, the, uh, the company that's filed for bankruptcy, the debtor, said, I want to restructure. And I have been able, judge, to get a Sharia compliant letter, uh, a commitment letter, to give me $125 million so I can try to restructure and get out of bankruptcy. So even today, in the Southern District, we have discussions about a loan instrument that is Sharia compliant in a bankruptcy proceeding. So, as you can see, this is all relevant to Muslim majority countries. And we all hear that Sharia is becoming the, uh, the next phase of reforms, whether in Egypt and the Islamists taking control in, in Egypt or in Tunisia or in all these other countries that many of the, uh, the Islamists are winning these elections and are bringing back this question of whether Sharia should become uh, the primary source of the legislation and reinstate it. Now we can have, we can deal with that in the question format because that's something that uh, I can elaborate on more in the questions. But in this particular circumstance, now we understand that it's very relevant. Islamic jurisprudence is very relevant to the changes that are going on in the Middle East and the Arab Spring, and it's still relevant and has been relevant to their legal system. So now, how is it relevant to the U.S.? We just explained that. For Muslims who are pious, like many faith-based communities, if you're Catholic and you want to get married, you go to your uh, city hall, you get a uh, marriage license, and you go to your priest and he solemnizes your marriage. If you're Jewish, you go to your rabbi and he solemnizes your marriage. If you're Hindu, you go to your uh, priest and he solemnizes your marriage. Muslims do the same thing. And as part of their uh, traditions, they enter into a Muslim marriage contract, something similar to a ketubah that Jews enter into. So when you enter into this uh, document, and you sign it, and you agree to whatever terms and conditions in it, and your marriage is falling apart, the tragedies of some or the fortunes of others, as a divorce lawyer, you know, we make money, and it's falling apart. So it does not work if, if marriages are not divorce, divorceable, you know. Uh, so when they do have these problems, and they're, and, and they're going to go through a divorce, all of a sudden, they want to comply with the terms and conditions in their document. So now, as Americans, as Muslims in the US who are married according to their traditions and have signed these documents, these documents are becoming an issue for adjudication in courts all over the United States. From New Jersey to Alabama, there are cases where husbands and wives are fighting about certain terms that are in their contract. So it's very relevant to Muslims here. Similarly, for Muslims who want to comply with their uh, estate plan, and they want to have a Islamic uh, Sharia compliant estate plan, those also are becoming more prevalent that Muslims are entering into these estate plans that are compliant with their religion. And courts, or certainly courts around the country, are forced to read them, review them, and enforce them. So it's relevant in estate planning. Um, so what, what I'm going to explain is 
how does Islamic law come into play in a United States court setting? So I give you some examples. But Islamic law, just like French law or German law, can come into play in a US court setting in, in only in two major categories. It can come into play as a foreign law, or it can come into play what we call parole evidence or extrinsic evidence. And what we mean by extrinsic evidence is extrinsic evidence necessary to be presented to a court to aid the court to better understand the expectations of the parties, to understand the surrounding circumstances to the entry of a contract, to um, clarify an ambiguity or uh, a vague uh, term in a contract, uh, to uncover a fraud, to correct a mistake. So it's extrinsic evidence that aids the court in making its determination. It's not really the law that comes into play. It's more it aids the court in its uh, determination. And I'm going to give examples. In the foreign law example, let's take an example. Let's take the uh, commercial case example. U.S. company enters into a contract with a Saudi company. And in the contract, say, billion dollar contract, they agree that in the event of a dispute, Saudi law would govern the <coughs> litigation. That's the law that governs. So the Saudi company enters with the American company. Things are not working out. They have a dispute. They file their action in Delaware, uh, state of Delaware and they litigate the case. Now the judge looks at the contract and says, well, based on the freedom of contract in our country, the parties are entitled to put in their contract choice of law and, 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 and choice of forum, Saudi law governs. So I'm going to apply, while I'm a Delaware state judge, I'm applying Saudi law. So the issue that was in dispute was what are the elements of damages? Let's say the judge makes a finding that the one party breached the contract. So how do I determine what are the damages in this dispute? The court found that the Saudi company breached the contract against the American company and had expert testimony, Professor Halaf from Columbia was the expert on that case, uh, saying that the elements of damages under Saudi law based on a 12th and 11th century tax says that there is something similar to what we call, under US law, consequential damages or uh, indirect damages, or lost profits of some sort. And, it was, and, and the court, based on this interpretation of pre-modern pre classical Islamic law as it pertains to consequential damages, rendered a decision and an or, a, a verdict in favor of the American company, it was $450 million. So the American company walked away with almost half a billion dollar in damages based on the application of Sharia, classical Sharia, not even a modern manifestation of Sharia. And this case has been upheld on appeal, and a case involved Exxon. Exxon won the case with that much money. So here's an example of a Delaware case. It's called Sabic versus Exxon. Exxon Mobil that interpreted Islamic law. So in that particular case, it was interpreted as a foreign law because it applied based on the uh, <coughs> desires of the parties. So let's look at a uh, another example of foreign law, a case that I that I that I uh, worked on. Um, in in a case where you look at the validity of marriages. So we have this interesting case where uh, parties marry uh, in a foreign country. Uh, after 10, 15 years of marriage, the parties enter in, uh, are having marital discord and disharmony, and they're fighting, and they're filing for divorce. Now, the husband claims that I never legally married my wife, therefore we, we have a non-marriage, and she should not be entitled to share in equitable distribution, marital assets, or pay alimony, or what have you. So now the issue before the court is the validity of that marriage. Was that valid? Under most jurisdictions in the country, the validity of a marriage is determined by the law of the place where the marriage took place. So if this marriage took place in Egypt, and it was a Muslim marriage, is it valid under Islamic law in Egypt? Was it in a West African country? Was it valid under the Western uh, West African uh, Islamic legal country. 
And based on that, we were able to convince the court that it was valid under Islamic law, the law that governed the dispute. So Islamic law came into the uh, uh, formula here as the law to determine the validity of the marriage. So that's a foreign law. So it came into play as a foreign law. And we see the, the foreign law on numerous circumstances. And sometimes the applicability of the foreign law is, necessary, is not necessarily accepted by the court all the time. Because as all of us know, the law of the land in our country is the Constitution. There is a public policy argument. So if I'm going to apply a foreign law that's going to be uh, violate our public policy, the courts are equipped with the tools to say, I'm not going to recognize it. So for example, a polygamous marriage is legal in Egypt. But if I bring that polygamous marriage contract to New Jersey, the judge is going to say, I'm sorry, that violates our public policy. So even though it's valid under that foreign law, we won't recognize it. So I just want you to keep in mind is that it's not a bright line rule. Everything about the, the, the sophistication of our legal system is that we don't focus on right line rules. Our adjudication process is, is vesting the judge with the authority to be able to balance all of the interest in the case, to see the demeanor of the parties, to listen to the uh, arguments of, uh, and the testimony that's admissible of all of the witnesses, and do his balancing to do a just adjudication of the law. So just because it's a foreign law doesn't mean it's going to get in. Just because I say I agree in my contract that I will uh, enter into a polygamous marriage, that's not going to be recognized by an American court. So an example where the court refused to recognize. I worked on this very interesting case. Um, father and mother lived in the US, had a child. Things are not working out. She returns back to Syria, to her mother country. While she's in Syria, the husband returns to Syria, institutes a divorce action, they get divorced in Syria, and the court awards custody to the mother as the custodian. Now the father leaves, goes back uh, to the United States, the mother stays there. He visits with the child, several years into it, she calls him up and says, oh listen, I would like to come and visit my family in the US, give me permission so I can bring your daughter with me, and this way she can visit you uh, at home and you can spend time with her in the US. So the husband agrees. Her uh, ulterior motive was she found somebody that she was going to marry, she flies over to a southern state, gets married, and takes the kid and says, well, now I'm going to be living in the United States and this is my new husband. What does the father do? The father calls his lawyer in Syria and says, look, she just did this, I want custody of my daughter. And the, uh, the law in Syria is that if you remarry, it makes you ineligible to keep the child. It's a bright line rule. While it's a bright line rule on its face, it's really a rebuttable presumption. The courts can say no, the remarriage alone is not sufficient. But when you read the statute, the statute says remarriage makes you ineligible to keep the child. So he brings this order, brings it to the court, and says, judge, recognize my custody order. The judge says, you know, fine and dandy, I think it's an interesting order, but that violates our public policy. Unless you can show me that the court in Syria took a best interest evaluation and made sure that the change of custody from mother to father was based on best interest, it's against our public policy to recognize it. So the court refused to recognize it. So in other words, the foreign law comes into play and must be considered. Sometimes it will be recognized and sometimes it will be not because it depends on the balancing of our public policy and our law. Now let's look at some examples that are not in the foreign law realm, but in the extrinsic evidence realm. As I explained to you, Muslims get married, um, and during uh, the method that they get married, they have their families negotiate and talk to each other. Because this is another interesting thing that maybe is, is missing, and I should have made this point earlier. The problem with any time we're going to look at uh, Sharia, and I'm going to give you examples of marriage law, you're automatically going to apply your conception of how you run your life today, how our law deals with gender equity, 
how we apply our law, how we have the equities between genders are a little bit different. Uh, the issue about having a guardian represent your, the, the daughter in the negotiations um, is different for us. But we, we, have, we cannot superimpose our conceptions today to the way another culture um, managed and organized its culture, its society, and its economic system. In other words, that we are not doing a favor to better understand Sharia if we're looking at Sharia through the prism of the United States Constitution. If we're looking at Sharia based on same-sex marriages today, uh, and looking at uh, you know the equities that we have in gender and the discrimination issues and so forth and so on, the concept of citizenship, intermarriage, and all of these are issues of the 21st century, a product of the French Revolution, American Revolution going forward. So if we want to understand the system, we want to try to put ourselves in, in this historical context. And if you look at the historical context, the system will make more sense to you. Not necessarily that the system can be resurrected and replicated today. We need to understand, was it functioning properly? For example, when it comes to marriage. Well, marriage today, I met my, 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 my wife, is my college sweetheart. I started dating her when I was in sophomore. And we've been together, now we've married almost 20 years. My marriage to my wife is an individual relationship. It's me and her. She's not marrying into my family. I'm not marrying into her family. We live today in a urbanized, the structure of the labor is different, uh, the, the mode of production is different. Our marriage is a personal, individual issue. But in pre-modern times, it was a family relationship. Because you have to say, is this family socially, religiously compatible for my daughter? Is this family a family that we can work together? Is this family close enough that is going to help us keep our economic unit together. It's a merge and a fusion of families. The individual actually is not that relevant. It's really the family unit that's relevant. So we have to look at those differences to better understand the system. So when Muslims get married, you enter into these negotiations with the families, and you have something called the mahr, which has been loosely translated as a dower or a dowry. And when Muslims sign off on this particular contract and the wife agrees to this sum of money, part of that money may be paid in advance, which is called the advance portion. And the remaining portion is called the deferred portion, which is paid at the happening of a certain event, usually the divorce of the husband, the dissolution of the marriage, or the death of the husband. So now, in the US, you have these cases where the husband signs at the dotted line saying, I'm going to pay my wife $50,000 at the dissolution of the marriage or, or my death. You're going through a divorce. Now the court has this document and needs to determine, is this document enforceable? So now this is where extrinsic evidence comes in. I, I, I tried this case, the first case in New Jersey, uh, called Odatullah versus Odatullah. It was in 2002. My client entered into a contract with her husband. It was a short-term marriage. It was a $10,000 dowry. Husband refused to pay. So we uh, filed our complaint for divorce, and we demanded the payment and the enforcement of the marriage contract. So for the first time, Judge Seltzer in Passaic County, he's never seen a Muslim marriage contract. And he sees these words, maher, sharia, I don't know what all this is about. So the judge needed extrinsic evidence to aid him to better understand what's going on. So we explained to the court, well, Muslims get married this way. There's an offer of marriage, there's acceptance, there are witnesses. And they sign a marriage contract. And in a marriage contract, it has a provision called mahr, similar to a dower. And this is what it means. It's a payment that has to happen at the dissolution of the marriage or death of the party. So now, this extrinsic evidence about what sharia is, as it pertains what is sharia, law of marriage, now the judge is like, all right, now I understand what's going on here. I know what, what happened. So what I'm going to do now, Judge Chelsea says, now I have to apply New Jersey law. Now I understand what all this is about. Let me understand how New Jersey law would come in. This is, according to me, it appears to be a contract. Offer and acceptance. Did, was he forced or threatened or coerced to sign that document? Uh, is there, uh, did they discuss this document before? Was the document in a language that he can read? Did he enter in this document voluntarily? Was there a meeting of the minds? 
So the judge applies basic New Jersey contract law. And when he said all of the elements of a valid contract under New Jersey law have been satisfied based on the facts of the testimony and based on the understanding of what the expectations of the parties are, the judge enforced it based on New Jersey law. And the judge specifically said, I don't see anything contrary to our public policy in New Jersey for me to enforce a contract. Just because it was entered into in a marriage that, that people have their own religion and their traditions is not a violation of our separation of state and church. The judge said, I'm not opining or interpreting Sharia. I'm just looking at the circumstances and pigeonholing them into what New Jersey law requires. As long as I can apply what he called neutral principles of law, and neutral principles of law means New Jersey contract law, I am not violating the First Amendment, and I have the authority to enforce this contract. And the judge enforced it. Now, another case, identical, but with a little bit of, of, of a twist. Same thing, Muslims, but the contract was written in Persian. And the husband, born, raised in Washington State, had no clue what Persian is. He looks at everybody, all right, he signs. He doesn't know what's going on. And they gave him the document the day of the marriage. So two years into the marriage, things are not working out. She sues, she wants a $25,000 dowry. The husband said, I didn't even know I signed that. I don't even read that language. So when the judge looked at the surrounding circumstances, he said, hold on. Was there an offer? Was there acceptance? Was there a meeting of the minds? How could there be a meeting of the minds if he didn't even understand what he was signing? He didn't read that language. There was no, no one said or testified that we translated it for him. No one explained that he knew what he was signing. And he didn't even have the necessary time to ponder and think about it. It was the day he had 500 guests. What is he going to do? Say no in front of everybody and make himself look like a fool? So the court refused to sign it, refused to enforce it. But the court refused to enforce it not because it's Sharia. They refused to enforce it because there was no meeting of the minds. The court knows what Islamic marriage is, but it has to comply with those elements. So these are cases all over the country. There's probably 40 to 50 reported cases that involve Muslim marriage contracts around the country. So this is a pretty uh, happening area that courts around the country are, are interpreting. So now we looked at Islamic law as a foreign law in the, in the Delaware case. And we looked at now Islamic law as a extrinsic evidence in a marriage case. The same thing would come into play. Um, let me see if I give you another fascinating example. I, I have some very interesting uh, cases that I've worked on. Listen to this case. <laughs> this is going to blow your mind. I get this husband. He's worth $100 million. I, I wish I was representing him. I, I got the poor wife, and, and just as an expert. So he meets this woman. He lives in New York. She lives in London. You know, they fall in love. They start traveling back and forth. They're of Muslim background. He's so rich, he says, you know, we're going to go get married in Italy. So they, they, they go to Italy. They fly all of these guests from all over the world, and they get married in Italy. They don't get a marriage license from, from the Italian authorities. And they just fly a learned jurist from the family. And he comes and he solemnizes the marriage according to Islamic law. So they get married. They go on their honeymoon. She goes back to London, New York. They live in both uh, countries. Uh, they have a child together. Five years into it, things are not working out. She files for divorce. Well, of course, what does he say? I never married her. We just had like a party. This wasn't really a marriage. So now, with the applicability of New York law and the applicability of Islamic law, we were able to, we had experts on Islamic law and experts on New York law. Um, and we were able to convince the other side that they had a great likelihood of probably losing the case that there is a strong likelihood that the court will find that the marriage that was performed in Italy was legal and was valid. And they settled the case. So you can see where Islamic law comes into play in cases that could be 
really huge figures. I had another case which uh, uh, is still being litigated, so I'm not going to tell you any names or just give you examples, but it was a, 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 a multi-million dollar verdict against a big trucking company, and the, at the time of the trial, it turned out that the decedent was married, but when they weren't able to determine when she was married, and they found some documents, and if she was legally married, the people who filed the lawsuit didn't have authority to file the lawsuit. It was a surviving husband that had the right to file the lawsuit. So it was, it, these cases can, can involve millions and millions of dollars just on interpretation of Islamic law based on whether classical Islamic law in the US or Islamic law as a source of a law in these other foreign jurisdictions. So it's a really very, very important area. And again, the anti-Sharia movement that is saying that Sharia is coming to supplant the Constitution is much ado about nothing. And all it's focused on is on the politicization of Sharia. Sharia is not just amputating the thief's hand. Sharia is not the uh, stoning of an adulterer. By the way, stoning of an adulterer, there is no express Quranic verse that says that you could stone an adulterer. It's a Jewish tradition adopted by the Muslims early on. You have enough stoning verses in the Old Testament other than adultery. <laughs> do we, do we disregard the entire Old Testament with all the moral messages and, and stories that are in that document because they're stoning in the Old Testament? So we cannot look at the entire Sharia legal system only on, an, on one or two of these particular issues because that's not fair. It's not fair to the Old Testament. It's not fair to the New Testament. It's not fair to, to, to the Quran or any other, other religion. <coughs> My son is in AP US history. He loves American history. So he, he, you know, we have these discussions about our founding fathers on a regular basis. And uh, it, it just, it, it, it boggles my mind as I read more about our founding fathers, how way ahead of time they were and the way they viewed our country, our democracy, and how our system would function. So I'm going to conclude and give you an opportunity for, uh, for questions with George Washington's farewell address. He says, the nation which indulges towards another a habitual hatred or a habitual fondness is to some degree a slave. It is a slave to its animosity or a slave to its affection, either of which is sufficient to lead it astray from its duties and interests. And this is where our founding fathers ahead of the time. It's all about fairness. It's all about balance. Our country was built that we don't take sides. And we don't want to be slave to our blind hatred against Muslims. And we don't want to be a slave to our blind love to any other nation. We always have to keep that balance. So they were ahead of their time back then, and they still are ahead of their time uh, today. So I'm um, open for questions. And every question is open. I'm not afraid.
Yeah, let me ask it. Let me explain to you. <laughs> I just tried to explain that you got to look at things in historical context. Now, I collect old family law books. I just picked up a book from 1905 in family law in the United States. It talks about age of consent 12 for marriage. It talks about a wife not being able to maintain a claim against her, uh, her husband or cannot testify against her husband. A claim that she's not that at the at, at a particular uh, juncture in our history, uh, her wages of labor would not inure to her, her husband home. That her property would go to the husband. But we evolved. By that at that time, when these statutes in 1905 were written, under Islamic law, a Muslim woman has legal capacity to enter into contracts, legal capacity to buy, sell by fixed inheritance law, receives property. And in 15th century Aleppo, 40% of endowments, charitable endowments that were registered and created in Aleppo were created by women. 25% of uh, charitable endowments created in Cairo were created by women. You have to look at historical context on those particular issues. Islam as a government or Sharia, or as a political system that govern the Muslim communities, is not a nation state. Nation state and this concept of citizenship and equality and citizens depending on race, religion, and creed is after the 18th, 19th century. And we know that up until the 40s and 50s here with the, the, the legacy of slavery and the legacy of segregation and, and Jim Crow and so forth is not very, it's, it's not that old, I'm talking 40, 50 years ago. So now when it comes to the issue of the uh, treatment of Muslim versus non-Muslim, the way Islam functioned was communitarian pluralistic. In other words, each community, today we identify based on our nationality and citizenship. I'm an American, my belonging to America is because of my citizenship. But in pre-modern times, I belong to the Muslims because I was Muslim. I belong to the Christians because I was Christian. I belong to the Jewish community because I was Jewish. Society was divided based on religious affiliation in communities. Each community had autonomy. So until today, by the way, let's say you are Jewish, and you're married to a Jewish woman, and you live in Cairo. You're having problems with your spouse. Do you think Egyptian family Islamic law governed your dispute? Absolutely not. Jewish law, till today, in Egypt, in Morocco, in Syria, governs the disputes relating to anything related to marriage, divorce, custody, inheritance, is governed by Jewish law for the Jewish community. Same, in fact, for the Christian thing, is much more complicated. The Anglicans have their own law. The Catholics have their own law. The Orthodox have their own law. The Protestants have their own law. I did a very interesting case in Ohio where I had to opine as an expert on the law of the Anglicans in Jordan and the Greek Orthodox. <laughs> and more fascinating, there is what's called uh, conflict of law issues regarding if I'm an Orthodox Christian and my wife is an Anglican, which law governs? And did she really convert to become an Orthodox or did I convert to become an Anglican so that we know which law would govern the divorce, the custody, and the dispute between us, and which ecclesiastical court are we going to submit to? So when we look at the pre-modern society with these communities, that's each community run itself. Now, in the commercial end, if there are cases between Christians and Jews and Muslims and Jews, those issues may implicate potentially a Muslim judge that would come into play. But I have, and I will refer you, you can email me, cases after cases where, where Christian and Jewish litigants would prefer to appear in front of a Jewish, a, a Muslim judge to resolve their dispute as opposed to go into any ecclesiastical court. This is pre-modern time. As it pertains to the equity of women, from a historical perspective, for a woman to be able to own her own property and to be able to control her own destiny financially, that was a huge revolution. But is that equal to 21st century New Jersey law? Of course not. But the question is, there's enough raw data and material on the jurisprudence of equity in Islamic law, in Islamic history as it pertains to women, to create a modern jurisprudence. So in historical context, it's different. Today, this non-Muslim 
If you are, I will give you a list of cases in Egypt, Christians filing lawsuits because they are unable to get a divorce. Because under Egyptian law, if you are a Coptic Christian, the only authority to dissolve your marriage is the ecclesiastical court of the Copts. And they're not going to give you a divorce. So guess what they're doing? Copts are converting to Islam and getting divorced. <laughs> so that also is not fair either. But in historical context, it's a bit different. But I agree with you on an issue of gender equity from a 21st century perspective, that's, that's not fair because we're not looking at the same system. Today, we're talking about same-sex marriages. We were stoning uh, gay people 50 years ago. Next. To what extent would you uh, say that there's a correlation between Islamic law uh, and Sharia law, and Talmudic law? And were they correlated in any specific way as they developed? That is, did the one refer to the other and back and forth? Very correlated. And interesting, at inception, at Islamic law, well, the proper way to articulate this is that both Jewish law and Islamic law did not evolve from a vacuum. The Sumerian, Babylonian, uh, Farhanic um, legal legacy of the Near Middle East is substantial. I mean, the first code of Hammurabi and uh, the law that was in that Near and Middle East pre-Judaism and Islam was very strong. So Judaism benefited and evolved out of that Babylonian, Sumerian heritage. Same, Islam benefited from that heritage and from the Jewish heritage and its development. There's a, there's a recent book from, uh, uh, from Harvard University Press discussing just the issue of custom, the role of custom as a source of law and interpretation under Jewish law. And it says that during the general period, that Islamic law influenced the whole conception of custom under Jewish law. So as you can see, early you would have the Jewish legal tradition was much more developed, Islam nascent community evolving. But as Islam by the 7th, 8th, and 9th century became the most sophisticated legal system, it started influencing the other legal systems. And Memoids is one example uh, in his commentaries on Aristotle and writing in Arabic. Just go home. <laughs> Tells her, go home. She comes back a second time. 
And she says, oh, prophet, I sinned. I need to be executed. He says, you know, you probably touched him. You probably kissed him. You probably didn't have to. Just go home. <laughs> she leaves. She comes back a third time and says, I sinned. I need to be executed. Because, she, because for a moral system that is focused on the hereafter, not living here, her focus was, I'm concerned about what's going to happen to me in the hereafter. I want to get this over with now. Let me just pay my dues because I'm going to be free forever. And when she came the third time, the prophet says to his companions, is she a fool? I mean, why is she coming here? I gave her because there's this privacy. The whole purpose of having four witnesses to, to, to uh, witness relates to an issue of privacy. So it's you and your creator if you commit this sin. So people also miss that perspective that this execution is not willy-nilly so simple. It requires real heightened procedural protections that are impossible to meet. So yes, there should be more PR, but you know, I'm trying that right now. <laughs> yes, I'd like to ask you, uh, under Shiara, and I think you mentioned this earlier, that Loans and having earning interest, and, mm. and uh, I'm just wondering how how is this dealt with in the international community uh, with uh, loans and uh, commercial transactions? It's dealt with very well. A lot of smart lawyers trying to make a lot of money playing, you know, the arbitrage game. Now, the the the, the, the other thing about uh, Islamic finance as it pertains to interest is we cannot look at interest. Uh, um, without looking at the other pieces of the puzzle. So when we look at a moral economy under Islamic law, there are many pieces to that puzzle. One of those pieces to the puzzle is to say you can't sell something that you have not created. Uh, you can't enter into contracts that are have uh, excessive uncertainty or speculation. You cannot discharge a debt. When you take money from somebody or sell them, you own that money. You cannot have limited liability to limit your liability because that is also not moral. Also, you can't charge interest, or you can't have this increase. So you have to look at all these pieces of the puzzle to look at where interest plays a part in the moral economy. Why we call it interest, the strict interpretation is that you don't pay riba, which under Jewish, uh, under uh, Hebrew, it means the same thing, which is increase rib. But if you look at the way the, the prohibition on this increase uh, originated in the Quran, it originates in a particular, I actually wrote, believe it or not, I wrote, uh, I co-authored a, a, a law review article on the Islamic law of bankruptcy. Uh, and I published it last year at the International Lawyer and had a lot of discussion on this issue of interest. So in the Quran, there's a verse that says, during pre-Islamic Arabs, they would go to their merchant and say, you know, I need, I need a loan. Give me a hundred, uh, give me some money. So he takes the money and he says, I'll pay you back in two months. Two months pass and the debtor goes back to the credit and says, listen, I don't have the money. No problem, I'll increase it. So there is this cycle of debt where the money continues to appreciate, appreciate, appreciate. And this poor guy who's not able to make ends meet is not able to get out of that cycle of debt. So that was the original objective of pro prohibiting the interest. So it's related on the appreciation of this cycle of debt. And looking at money as not simply a tool with, uh, to conduct trade, but as a commodity itself that has value that can be traded. So that's one of the reasons why interest is prohibited. Because once money becomes a commodity, it it's hoarded, and when it's hoarded, you know, people, there are more rich people and poor people, so there's exploitation. How they deal with it today is that you, in, in most Muslim uh, uh, commercial transactions, it, we have to be in the, in the game together, meaning that we have to share risk. So as long as you and I agree that you're going to give me $100 and I'm going to trade in it, you're going to get the benefit of the profit and you're going to get the benefit of the loss. So as long as they are joint venture relationships, partnerships, whether they're partnerships in uh, my labor with your, with your capital or we both pool our capital, there cannot be a transfer of the risk. You have to share the risk. So instead of interest, 
you will have a profit and you can share the profit. But today, you have these big firm, uh, law firms in New York City, in London, who now are making millions upon millions structuring Sharia compliant financing. And they are not looking at all the other pieces of the puzzle. They still have limited liability. They still have discharge of bankruptcy. They still have all these other things. All they focus on is on the issue of interest. So they make these contracts that are compliant with Sharia as it pertains to interest. Instead of them making it an interest, they call it a profit or a commission. And they have this trading that is Sharia compliant. But it's devoid of the moral underpinning. The purpose of it is to have social and economic equity and redistribution of wealth amongst everybody and again keeping social harmony. But that's how they deal with it. Well, yes, Saudi Arabia is also orthodox in interpretation of Shia. And with their money, they're exploiting it to Madras here and there. Now, that's what I think Americans, that's what we fear most, is seeing that kind of Shia opposed to what you Yeah, well, the truth of the matter is, is that the, the Saudi strict constructionist version of Sharia is backed with so much money. So we hear more of that. But there's still very influential and powerful modern jurists that are writing in the Middle East and in the United States that really are a serious foe to, to this strict construction's interpretation. Well, that's true. I, I understand because it's not worth the front page. I mean, our CIA director having sex with the woman who wrote his book is more important. You know? I mean, I get calls all the time for, for, for media interviews. They don't want me to talk about the nuances and the legal subtleties. They want me just to talk about, you know, the stuff that's sensational. So that goes back to our media and technology. So technology today only works on sound bites. That's why I'm saying you represent a generation that was more engaged. We're interested in understanding the subtleties and evaluating issues as, as wholesomely. Today, it's you know that one second thing. Saudis are you know supporting these madrasas in, in Pakistan who are giving money to the Taliban and you know they're they're, they're executing adulterers. That's unfortunate. You're true. You're true. Hundred <laughs> percent. I remember when I lived in Mexico years ago, um, they had a Sharia Muslim school, and they Totally the opposite. I was having this interview, I did this interview on Dream TV, which is a major progressive mainstream uh, channel in Egypt. So it's a major opponent to the religious right in Egypt. And the, the interview that I was interviewed was to discuss about our judicial system and our prosecutors. So in our discussion, he says to me, listen, in Egypt, our prosecutor is part of the uh, court. So they have the same budget, and when we go into a court, there's three levels of, of, uh, of tables. You have the judge on the top, the prosecutor under him, and then the lawyer, the defense lawyer, that is under. And the defendant is in a uh, prison cell. He's in a like cell with uh, bars and, and so forth, and he's sitting there dressed as a prisoner. Which is exactly what you said. It's a French system in, in Egypt, which you're guilty until you prove your innocence. And I said, well, no, in our, in our system, even if you're in jail, when you come in front of that jury, you don't have any uh, shackles, you're wearing a suit, you look normal. You're innocent until they prove that you're guilty. Under Islamic law, it even goes further on the procedural due process. If you, a confession in the US, as long as a confession is entered voluntarily, without coercion, that controls your case. So I confessed, I killed so-and-so. It's impossible for you to get over that confession, as long as it was willing and voluntary. Under Islamic law, at the mo right before the moment of your execution, if you withdraw the confession, the case starts all over again. <laughs> all over again. So 
you can withdraw your confession at any time. And the other thing about criminal law and Islamic law, which again, we're not comparing apples to apples. Under Islamic law, you don't have the apparatus of the state. Professor Hadlock just published a book, and, and for all of you, you need to read this book. It's titled Impossible State. It's uh, about Islam, politics, and the moral predicaments of modernity. It just got published. Columbia University <coughs> Press was published two days ago. In this particular uh, uh, book, the, uh, Professor Hadlock clearly shows that a, an Islamic state, a Sharia state, as a moral state, is an impossibility because a nation state is, cannot accommodate a moral system. And in this explanation, and, and why it's relevant to, uh, to, to, to our discussion, is the state was very minimal in its involvement in the uh, management of the Muslim communities. Because as a moral system that focused on prayer and moral responsibility of the hereafter, you did not need so much people to govern you. You had that self-regulatory thing, because you're, as a moral subject, you're born, you're raised about your ablution, how you pray, how you think of God 24-7. This is your life. Your concern is the hereafter. You regulate yourself a little bit better as opposed to having the course of state involved when the moral is not part of your, of, your, of your upbringing. So in this case comes to criminal law. If, God forbid, I am involved with you and I murder you for some reason, there is no Islamic state that's going to be involved in me murdering you. So it would not be the state of Saudi versus me. It will be your family against me. And your legal heirs have three options. Option one, which is the preference, and there's a lot of traditions from the Prophet that forgiveness is the highest ideal. Your family say, we forgive him. We don't want anything from him. Option two, your family says, I want the blood money. We lost you pay your blood money. Or number three, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Execute them. That's when the state comes in. The state comes in to execute me once you make that decision. Your legal heirs make that decision. So that's why when we look at criminal law today in the modern state, look how different it is. So that's why we are not looking at Islam and, and, and pre-modern uh, Islamic legal systems in a proper fashion if we don't look at the historical context and look at these different nuances and, and, and differences. description of the strict concern, constructionist military Muslims that are not the Muslim Brotherhood. By the way, the Muslim Brotherhood would be considered modernist. The Salafis would be the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia, the Taliban, uh, the, some of the Egyptian Islamist groups, not the Brotherhood, that are, that are Salafis. She's asking how, why the ascendancy of, of some of these groups. The Salafi's ascendancy is not really very fast. It's the ascendancy of the mainstream political Islam, like the Muslim Brotherhood the, uh, in Egypt, or the Nahda in, uh, in Tunisia. But the Salafis also, it's an identity issue. I mean, it's the same, I would say the same circumstances that there was an ascendancy of the Christian coalition during the Reagan and Bush era, and the same things. Like today, when you think about the Tea Party, I was having this discussion on national on, on, on Egyptian TV. They said, in 2040, whites are going to be a minority in the United States. So what's going to happen, Mr. Rawan, about this politics? Is, is American politics going to change? I said, in 2040, it's not going to be about white majority or minority. It is no longer about minority and majority. It's about that the trend in our country is intermarriages. The trend. <laughs> Obama is half white. So in, in the end, the Tea Party, the ascendancy of the Tea Party is exactly against the evolving notion of what it means to be American, which is we are a melting pot of all these different cultures and all these new cultures that are coming in that are changing the dynamic. I was reading a, a few study about intermarriage. In some states, it's like 20% of, of new marriages are intermarriages. 
that's the evolving thing, and that ascendancy of the Tea Party is this reaction. On the Senefis, it's the same thing. They're seeing this pre-modern conception that they have fly out the, the, the window. And they're seeing that their people are starting to become more open to Western ideas. Uh, they're more open to a progressive reinterpretation and rejuvenation of the tradition that is based on different concept of morality and a different concept of equity. So they're afraid of these changes. And I don't think in the end they will not succeed. And the Muslim modernists, like the Brotherhood, they're really becoming more and more mainstream. And as they get involved in politics, it is by by implication, they must moderate because they are not going to be able to run a country individually. Ideology is dead. There's ideology is over. Now it's coalitions and and, and interest groups. Thank you.